let me invite you and welcome you to round two as we dig deeper into Professors Boris Hirsink and Jeffrey Jenkins' new book, Republican Party Politics in the American South, 1865 to 1968. In the first book talk, Boris and Jeff gave us an excellent description of the research findings and the data. Today, we have invited an outstanding group of scholars to analyze this new data and new thinking about the history of Republican Party politics in the South and its implications for today. So let me begin with uh, Kimberly Johnson. She is a professor in the arts and sciences at New York University in the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis. She is also an affiliate faculty member of the Wagner School at NYU. Dr. Johnson's research uh, focuses on American political development, urban and metropolitan politics, race, and ethnic politics. She's published numerous articles on American political development and racial and ethnic politics, and she is the author of two books, Reforming Jim Crow, published by Ox Oxford University Press, and Governing the American State, published by Princeton University Press. She is currently uh, completing a new book manuscript tentatively titled Dark Concrete that is exploring the development of black power urbanism in Newark and East Orange, New Jersey, and closer to us here in California, Oakland and East Palo Alto. Dr. Johnson earned her PhD in political science from Columbia University, so welcome. Ashley Jardina is an assistant professor of political science at Duke University. Her research explores the nature of racial attitudes, the development of group identities, racial conflict, and the way in which these factors influence political preferences and behavior. Her current project explores the conditions under which white racial identification among white Americans is a salient and significant predictor of policies, candidates, and attitudes toward racial and ethnic groups. Her recent publications include In-Group Love and Out-Group Hate, White Racial Attitudes in Contemporary U.S. Elections. That will be published this year in Political Behavior and The Genesis of the Birther Rumor, Partisanship, Racial Attitudes, and Political Knowledge, published in the Journal of Race, Ethnicity, and Politics. She earned her PhD at the University of Michigan, where she won the American Political Science Association APSA Award for the Best Dissertation on race and ethnic politics. Devin Cowie is the Silverman Family Career Development Associate Professor of Political Science at MIT. Dr. Cowie is primarily interested in the fields of American politics and American political development and political methodology. His book, The Unsolid South, Mass Politics and National Representation in a One-Party Enclave, published in 2018 by Princeton University Press, won the APSA Leon Epstein Outstanding Book Award. It examines the causes and consequences of ideological diversity among Southern Democrats in Congress and their rightward migration from New Dealers to pivotal centrists. Dr. Cowie's work has appeared in several journals, including the Journal of Politics, American Political Science Review, World Politics, among other journals, and he was awarded the Warren Miller Prize for the best article published in Political Analysis. He received his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, my alma mater as well. John Aldrich uh, is the Fitzer Pratt University Professor of Political Science at Duke University. Hi, John. Uh, Dr. Aldrich specializes in American politics and behavior, formal theory, and methodology. His numerous articles have appeared in several prestigious journals, including the American Political Science Review, Journal of Politics, American Journal of Political Science, Public Choice, and others. He has also authored or co-authored several books, including Why Par Parties Matter, Political Competition, and Democracy in the American South, published by the University of Chicago Press. Dr. Aldrich received grants from the National Science Foundation, the National Endowments for the Humanities. He served as co-editor of the American Journal of Political Science. He's also been a fellow at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford and is an elected fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He earned his PhD at the University of Rochester. <laughs> 
Uh, I should add parenthetically that uh, Dr. Aldrich and I were colleagues in the political science department at Michigan State University many too many years ago to mention, uh, where he, we had offices actually across the hall from each other uh, when I was an assistant professor. So it's nice to see you again, John, and welcome to USC and the Price School Book Talks. So I'm uh, really delighted that this stellar group of scholars, had, has, scholars has agreed to participate in this book talk today. Uh, I'd now like to give a brief introduction of the two authors. Uh, Jeffrey Jenkins is the USC Provost Professor of Public Policy, Political Science, and Law. He is also the Judith and John Bedrosian Chair and Director of the Bedrosian Center for Governance. In addition, Dr. Jenkins is the Director of the Political Institutions and Political Economy Collaborative at USC and the editor of the Journal of Politics. Boris Hirsink is an Assistant Professor in the Department of Political Science at Fordham University where he studies American political institutions and national party organizations. Their book uh, analyzes new important data that show how the Republican Party changed over time from being a broad biracial coalition to a mostly white party today with significant implications for contemporary politics in America. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Jeff. Thanks, Jack, uh, uh, for a great introduction. Uh, first, I want to thank everybody for taking the time to participate. Uh, I know you have lots of other things to do than read my book, read, read our book, and uh, uh, take some time to Zoom with us today. Um, we really do appreciate it. Um, so I just wanted to say a couple things, and I'll turn it over to Boris. I mean, we, we, we talked for 45 minutes the other day. so. Um, we're not going to do as much talking nearly, at, hopefully this time around, uh, certainly at the beginning. Uh, I did want to say just a couple of things. Uh, first, just a, a little bit about the genesis of this project. And, uh, and I think the project began in the way that a lot of projects begin, and just by talking about things. So Boris would routinely uh, plop himself down in the chair in my office during graduate school. He was my student at the University of Virginia. And we just talk about things, right? Talk about stuff we've read, talk about ideas that we might have. Um, and one of them revolved around the notion that for a long period of time, uh, you know, a couple of generations, uh, the Republican Party got absolutely nothing from the South in terms of electoral college votes. And yet during the same time, uh, Republican Party leaders at the national level continued to allow um, Republican delegates from the South to attend the national convention. And the South had about a quarter of the convention delegates uh, for much of that time. And the question that we raised was why? You know, why, why, was, why, why did the national Republican leadership allow the South to continue to play a big role in major decisions like the choice of the presidential nominee when it was clear that uh, states from that region weren't going to provide anything on election day. So we wrote that paper, we investigated, we wrote that paper, and uh, we, we discovered that the answer to that particular question could be written in a paper. We learned a lot more about the region, the uh, politics of the South at that time, politics of the Republican Party in particular. Uh, we learned that uh, despite the fact that the Republican Party really wasn't a party in the way that we define things, it really didn't try to win elections at the national level, you know, very much, aside from, you know, pockets in the Appalachian area. Um, people cared about being in the Republican Party in the South because there was uh, a lot of money attached to that. There was a lot of patronage attached to that, especially when Republicans held the White House. And there would be battles in the Southern states between groups. And those groups typically were uh, among two, the, the black and tans and the lily whites. And we learned that, you know, we learned a little bit about them, but we learned that we don't know a whole lot about them. Um, and we wanted to learn a lot more, so we wanted to write a book. And um, a lot of time was spent collecting data for the book, collecting data on the, the racial identity of um, the delegates uh, over a long period of time. That took a while. Boris will have something to say about that in a minute. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that with the completion of this book, um, it doesn't really end our interest in the Republican Party and the South during this period. We, we speak about that at the very end, but uh, one example, Boris and I are, are talking about writing a follow-up paper um, soon, uh, 
uh, to really dive into what was at stake during these years. You know, we kind of hand wave a little bit around that, right? Patronage, 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 right? Money, side payments. Uh, but we don't put any numbers on that. And uh, people have asked us when we presented this paper, well, just how much money was involved, right? How, how lucrative was this? And uh, we think that we, have, we can make a stab at answering that now um, by looking at, in part, by looking at um, a set of uh, governmental reports that were released between 1928 and 1930, the subcommittee, of, subcommittee in the Senate of the Post Office Committee that investigated uh, the selling of patronage jobs in the South during this time. So there's 1,600 pages to analyze. We've looked through a little bit of it. And there's some really interesting stuff in there, right? Just in terms of just how many positions were available um, to be handed out uh, in, you know, in pretty excruciating detail, um, how much each individual who received that patronage appointment was willing to spend for it, was willing to pay to actually receive it, was willing to pay in some ways to keep, keep hold of it over time. Um, so it'll be a bit of a challenge to actually um, translate what we find in that, that document, that set of documents um, uh, into actual raw data to analyze. But I think we can do it and we can certainly tell an interesting follow-up story about what was going on in much more granular detail. So uh, to the extent that this book is done, uh, the project is not done. So to the extent that you have suggestions about things to think about in the future, there, there will be a future to this, at least in terms of a paper. So I'll turn it over to Boris now. Uh, yeah, I'm also very grateful for everybody uh, for agreeing to participate. We really appreciate it. We're, we're very excited to, to hear your thoughts. Um, in terms of the, the data, we talked about this in the, in the last uh, talk that we did pretty extensively, but uh, one of the things we ran into uh, in terms of the black and tans versus the Lily whites issue, which is essentially there's these two groups that are competing for control of each of the state uh, organizations, uh, a mixed race coalition that used to control each, each state organization with black and white Republicans. And at some point in each state, uh, white segregation is known as Lily whites who take over. We know a little bit about that uh, based on like research done by Haynes Walton uh, in the 70s, uh, but we don't have, we didn't have a comprehensive way of sort of getting at when for each state those conflicts played out, how they played out, uh, et cetera. And so one of the things we tried to do and we did uh, was collect data on uh, the race of each Republican delegate uh, from the South to national conventions between 1868 and 1952. And the way we did that is we had lists of those names and their hometowns and home states. And we, were ma we managed to uh, match those for 84% of them um, to, the to their individual census forms, which allowed us to uh, identify their race, whether they were white or black. And that gave us essentially a measure of how white slash black uh, each state organization was across time. Um, and it, one, allowed us to identify how for each individual state uh, the history developed. So at what point did the party flip from being controlled by black and tans to uh, lily whites, um, but all, and the extent to which it happened. Uh, but it also allowed us to test one of the crucial arguments the whites were making, uh, which was that there were electoral consequences, meaning in the post Jim Crow South, uh, were you able to uh, compete effectively as a Republican party if you were known as the black party? The Lily white argument was if we take over, we're gonna do better electorally. In practice, those Lily white people still mainly cared about the patronage, the financial rewards and all that. Uh, but in terms of the electoral performance, we find that that is actually true. The more white the party gets, um, at least in the outer South, um, the better the party does in elections. Uh, Kim, did you want to start since we kind of went in reverse order, I think? Jack introduced you first. So this is great. Thank you so much for inviting me to be um, a respondent of this. Um, in retrospect, maybe it's okay that it got canceled because here we are at, uh, at APSA. I know this was supposed to be a, a, a panel that we were going to have at APSA and uh, I'm really happy that we're able to do it um, again. Um, so, and I've seen parts of this book in conference papers as well as articles in studies in American political development. So it's really great to see this uh, project kind of come to fruition in this, in this really great book. I want to say a couple of things, kind of more about the, about what I really appreciate, I guess, in terms of 
methodologically or epistemologically about the book before actual points that I thought were really interesting and provocative of, uh, uh, within the book itself. Um, first, I want to say that I really, really appreciate the really respectful and thoughtful inclusion of and incorporation of Haynes Walton Jr.'s work. Um, I think that for a period in political science, American politics, there's been this kind of division between folks who study kind of mainstream American politics and racial and ethnic politics, between those who study just the South and those who study sort of national politics. And I really feel that your work really brings together all of these different kinds of literatures in a really engaging and thoughtful and critical way. So I really want to sort of really say thank you for kind of doing the work to kind of start moving us forward and really building upon um, what's been done in the past. Secondly, what I really like to uh, give a shout out to um, is, and I'm a real fan of, of, of footnotes, I should say, um, is your critical evaluation of the Dunning School. Um, that one of the issues I think with APD and sort of as we look at different parts of the American political his, uh, history is that often the data, if you will, is couched in or surrounded by some problematic interpretations. Um, and so then how do we sort of pull out the kind of really great kind of qualitative data, if you will, from a context that is, is kind of problematic, right? So how do we sort of pull out what's useful about the studies done um, on Southern politics during the kind of pre-civil rights movement era, the sort of post-reconstruction Jim Crow era um, in a way that is useful to us now and to future scholars um, and kind of bracketing and sort of acknowledging that you know, the Dunning School was, was there and that this has kind of distorted in some ways um, how we understand that moment in history. So I really wanna say that I really appreciate you all for doing that. So the third thing I think I wanna say is that uh, my, my last book, not the book that I'm working on right now, uh, is, recall, is, is the full title is Reforming Jim Crow, Southern Politics and State and Nation. Um, and that is a, a nod uh, to Vio Key, whose work really kind of hovers over my own work and my own understanding with the South and my grappling with Southern politics. And so what I thought was really interesting about your book is that in many ways it was Vio Key, but not, that in fact it's looking at the Republican Party and looking at what's happening in the South in this kind of post-reconstruction era and really sort of thinking about the silences, if you will, of that view he presents to us in his work. Um, and in particular, I'm struck by uh, the, the, the quote that you pulled out from him uh, about the, the state of the GOP in the South. Uh, it scarcely uh, deserves the name of party. It wavers somewhere between an esoteric cult on the order of a lodge and a conspiracy for plunder in accord with accepted customs of our politics. Its exact position on the cult conspiracy of scale varies from place to place. I just thought, you know, I love VOK in many ways, uh, but I think that that is such a great kind of quotation to kind of set up how you're thinking about the, the sort of the evolution of the Republican Party in the South. Is it a cult? Is it a conspiracy? Um, and what is it doing? Why is it there? Um, why does it persist when in fact, it kind of is not doing a lot, particularly in some in some of these states. But on the other hand, it's doing something, and I think the doing something is really fascinating. Uh, so my first, I guess, thought on this on the book uh, is really was along the lines of a key thinking about these are essentially zombie parties, um, and that in some ways they're sort of placeholders for the real. Um, Republican Party, the sort of modern GOP to emerge in the kind of post sort of, or the sort of 1950s civil rights movement. And I think what I found is something I didn't expect to find, which is that there's kind of a rich set of politics that's occurring um, within the South that is not necessarily affecting local or state politics, but it is a form of politics and is, is a form of political organization that is important um, and, and should be noted and possibly has uh, implications for later on. 
So one of the things I was thinking about is uh, why is it important that Blacks remained in the GOP in the South and why did they fight so hard to, to not be pushed out, to maintain um, either the explicit Black and Tan coalitions or the sort of quiet coalitions or the biracial coalitions that later evolved in places like Tennessee and Florida. And one of the things I think is important, I think, and they have this great quote somewhere in the book, uh, is that one of the Republican, Black Republican uh, delegates really says, you know, we have to be in, at least in a marginal way, in the Republican Party in the South, because otherwise, how do we make citizenship claims, right? That if they're totally pushed out of the Democratic Party and they lose that last little foothold in the Republican Party, then they're completely, they're like completely without any sort of citizenship, any type of citizenship claim. So yes, it is part of it. Yes, it is a lot of its patronage, but a lot of it is just literally keeping, you know, a finger in, in terms of being part of the sort of political conversation or, or having a claim to be part of a, a broader political conversation. The second thing that I thought about in terms of thinking about why is it important that Blacks remain remained in the GOP in some way in the South. Uh, as I was thinking about your account of uh, the nomination part, uh, nomination fight over Judge Parker. Um, and I thought that's a place where I would really like to see the role of Southern Black Republicans kind of coordinating with, or maybe not with the NAACP over how to sort of push back on the Parker nomination. Cause that really is a huge defeat. Um, as you rightly point out, uh, for, uh, for the Republicans, for Southern Republicans. And so I think to me, that's really kind of, it really made me think about why, why they're remaining um, and what does it mean? And then I, I'm sort of jumping around a little bit in terms of the book, but then moving forward, thinking about um, why it's important to think about the role of Blacks in the GOP is to, is to move to the case of Tennessee. Um, and I think in many ways, Tennessee kind of makes the claim or proves the claim that competitive-ish two-party systems actually works for Blacks. Um, that is, in Tennessee, uh, there is this sort of uncomfortable alliance between Church and Crump that actually leads to actual political payoffs in terms of roads and schools, et cetera, for uh, African-Americans in Tennessee. And I think that that in many ways kind of disproves the Lily White arguments, right? That having a competitive two-party system actually is good for Republicans and good for African-Americans. And so I think that's like a nice counterfactual that doesn't quite get a lot of play. And it's not believed obviously by the rest of, of the South who, just, who basically double down on the idea of uh, exclusion of, of African Americans. I thought the point that you made about the, uh, the less likely the, the GOP would be able to perform at the local and state level, the more likely blacks would remain in the Republican party. Um, I thought that was really interesting and, and something I hadn't really thought about as kind of a way to sort of defang and kind of, I guess, shunt, I guess, black political, uh, uh, aspirations into sort of a non-functional area, if you will. Um, and also, I think more importantly, is the way in which it blackens, I mean, sort of the opposite of your whitening, it, black, it blackens the GOP. Um, and so that in these kind of core um, Southern states, um, they're able to just completely delegitimize um, any opposition to the sort of one party rule. And I think that's really important, the sort of strategic way that um, that the democratic uh, power holders kind of engage in this kind of whitening slash blackening process that it's going both ways. Um, and again, you know, I think the interesting question, and this, I guess, is the subject of, of your next work is, you know, what are African American politicians like Perry Howard getting out of this? So he's king of the Republicans in Mississippi. What does that mean? Um, is that good? Is that bad? What are the trade-offs? You know, what are the benefits? And I think that's, again, an interesting kind of path to go down is to sort of think about what's, what's happening to all these sort of side payoffs. Um, and then finally, I think what I would, I think really is fascinating um, 
is, again, thinking about the impact of FDR and the New Deal on the sort of really fundamental transformation of the party system at that moment. Um, and I thought it was interesting that you essentially say that um, FDR's success essentially ends patronage and leads to this kind of collapse or weakening of the sort of old guard GOP, state GOP parties, and kind of opens up the possibilities of new, new GOP actors to kind of enter into the stage without kind of being tied to the sort of past you know, debates or, or fights with the sort of black and tans and the, and the lily whites that they really kind of enter it, not on the basis of, of this sort of post-Civil War settlement, but really as kind of providing an alternative to the post, to a new post-deal civil rights friendly um, hostility to the New Deal kind of uh, agenda. And so I think I'll leave it at that. Um, but I do like the fact that you use the notion of respectability um, in really interesting and provocative ways that I, I have not seen in American politics before. So thank you. Yeah, great. Hi, thank you all. I'm really delighted to be here. And it was a pleasure to read this book. And I also have kind of seen some of the uh, like little hints of it um, and knew that you were working on this. And um, I wanted to echo Kimberly and say that I also really appreciated um, the uh, credit you give early on to the great work that Haynes Walton had done on this topic. One of the things that I really thought was valuable about this book is that as someone who teaches classes on race and politics, often when I'm thinking about the role of political parties and talking with my students about this, I begin, um, as you mentioned, and, and sort of take note of in the book with the, uh, you know, the candidacies of Goldwater and Wallace and then Nixon is sort of the, the starting point of thinking about both the Republican Party uh, making headway in the South, but also um, very much the sort of beginning of the Republican Party using race um, and race baiting as a strategy to try to gain a foothold in the South. And obviously what you all have done here is to show that, you know, this happens much earlier. But what I think is really important is that a lot of the work that comes out of thinking about race in American politics beginning in um, you know, the 1950s and 1960s is coming out of the public opinion tradition. And that tradition is very much focused on the role that individual level racial attitudes play in American politics. Was so thinking a lot about the degree to which everyday white Americans have some sense of racial animosity toward people of color and the extent to which Republicans or any politicians can appeal to those attitudes um, to be electorally successful. And what you've done here, I think is really important and that you know, some work is done, but not a lot of work is done is kind of shift the focus to really explain to us um, how race has been used for a very long time by both parties as a tool for uh, parties to, and particularly whites to maintain power. So it's not just about these sort of individual level animosities that um, some white Americans have toward people of color. It was very much a, a way for um, the parties uh, over, you know, basically the history of the American party system um, to find ways to, uh, you know, win and, and to maintain power. In some ways, they were kind of independent of public opinion. And actually, one of the questions that I had for you as I was reading was, can we parse out more the extent to which the way the Republican Party and the Democratic Party used race was about the sort of internal mechanisms of, and, and sort of internal workings of the party machines and to what extent was this about sort of the larger American public? Because I think that that's a, a sort of an important part of the story and one that's not always clear um, as we're kind of thinking about the role of patronage and uh, sort of who the parties were talking to and who um, mattered uh, as the parties were trying to become um, you know, more electorally successful and, and thinking about the strategies of the black and tans and, and the lily whites. Um, and, you know, that's something to think about too that sort of changed over the sort of history of the party. And when we get to American politics in the 1950s and 1960s, the story that public opinion scholars tell is very much one about what's happening at the individual level um, outside of the party machine. And I think that um, your story involves sort of both of those components and it would be great to think through sort of more clearly like you know if, at what point are we talking about elites talking to each other and at what point are we talking about elites talking to sort of the um, broader uh, contingency of whites in the American South. But what I think is really valuable about this book is that um, you know it 
it takes us out of, of that framework, but it's just another really significant contribution to thinking about the extent to which race and racism is absolutely fundamental to American political development. And I was thinking that you could have called this book so many other things, because it's not really just a story about the Republican Party in the American South. It's a story about both parties in the American South. And it's a story about, um, very specifically, about the role of race and and racism. And that's a story that is often overlooked. I mean, I was thinking about this and kind of thinking about how that this relates to some of our contemporary debates. And I was like, you know, what, what would you all say, for example, to the critics of like the 1619 Project, um, who should want to kind of deny that race isn't part of the story? You know, you, you, I think you all provide very much a um, very empirically detailed uh, historical and, you know, very detailed case study of how uh, race is inextricable from uh, the way we understand the American political party system in the United States. So I have many other things, but I'll, I'll leave it there uh, so we can kind of move through everyone and, and get to all of our comments. Yeah, thanks very much for um, having me. Um, I really enjoyed uh, reading this book. Um, um, so I wanted to talk about uh, three points, and hopefully I'll be as efficient as <laughs> my predecessors. Um, feel free to get the hook and uh, pull me off the stage. Um, but um, one thing that I just want, first wanted to talk about the method of this book, and one thing that really struck me as a as someone who has also written a historically oriented book about you know the same region um, and relied very heavily on the incredible wealth of almost exclusively ideographic historical, you know, historiography written by, often published in fairly obscure journals by historians um, that can, you know, when you piece it together skillfully as you guys do and um, can really tell this amazing sort of summary story, like high level story um, where you're building on the work of so many other scholars but pulling them together efficiently and clearly and you do a masterful job at that. I mean, much better than I did. I would say you could cover like four times as many sources. It's a great job. And you also, on top of that, of course, collect this uh, great data and you use that skillfully to um, tell stories. And actually I wrote in a, when I was reading, um, when I was reading the book, I, there's a, a graph early on, a couple of graphs early on, but I just wrote a note to myself, like, I wish I had this, like, this graph in my book. You know, you just do a great job pulling together so many, um, so much information to tell a compelling narrative. Um, and I found the book fascinating to read. And even as someone who um, is pretty steeped in the period and in the region, um, I found myself learning new things almost every page. Um, and part of that, you were, you were covering events and phenomena and people that I wasn't too familiar with, but part of it is just the lens of seeing it all from the perspective of Republicans, which you know, especially after 1900 is not the perspective <laughs> that you use, that the story of the, the Southern politics typically gets told from, really kind of brought a different perspective to even familiar events. So I, I learned a great deal um, and very much enjoyed it. Um, I, I, um, one thing I'll say about the detail is that even, um, even as I was uh, sort of like relishing the detail, it, it's just one of those things that uh, the more detail you have, the more you want. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I'm glad that this project is continuing because there are all sorts of other questions and more, even more granular things that I wanted to learn about. So, you know, just, you know, at, on a, on a like very local level, like how were delegates chosen? Were they chosen by caucuses, some places, conventions, some places, primaries, maybe some places, I'm not sure. Um, uh, how were those meetings called? Who participated in them other than the meet leaders? Like how many people? Um, what? aside from bribery or, or uh, determined what presidential candidates were supported. Um, and I also kind of was um, just curious about learning more about how ordinary rank and file Southern Republicans, particularly African Americans, um, but not exclusively because um, there are some white Republicans, how did they feel about their party and, uh, and the state of their party and about its trajectory? Um, you know, what were their policy goals? What were their aspirations? What were their frustrations? I mean, I'm sure it was very frustrating to have a kind of dysfunctional party that was that really didn't deserve that name. Um, uh, so 
So anyway, I appreciated the detail, but then I wanted to know more. Um, one thing I wanted to say about method also is that, um, you know, this, you know, one could, uh, you know, it's obvious like, you know, in contemporary categories of political science to say this is a work of maybe American political development, but it also reminded me of this now pretty much lost tradition in history of just quantitative history, pulling together lots of data and, and, uh, and but really attention to the, the context to tell, you know, in large part, a descriptive story, you know, um, just filling in the details that almost everyone doesn't know. So I really uh, appreciated that. Um, so that's the first thing I wanted to talk about method. And the second thing I wanted to discuss um, was sort of the main causal claim, probably the thing that distinguishes it most from uh, that tradition in quantitative history that I was referring to, um, is this causal claim um, and the evidence you bring to bear uh, on it, um, that lily whiteism was a necessary condition for a competitive Republican Party post-1900. And I've, you know, this very plausible claim. Um, and the, the primary evidence that you present for it, is, present in favor of it is, is statistical in the form of basically looking at the within state correlation between the whiteness, this whiteness index, how white the Republican Party is in a state and how well the state did, uh, the, the party did in the next election, basically. Um, and uh, I, what I kept wanting more of in the sort of descriptive chapters was like a return to that, to that claim, because I thought, you know, um, it, 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 was, it sort of got uh, the surprisingly little attention in the remaining chapters. Um, which didn't really bother me as I was reading them because I found them fascinating, but I did sort of come away thinking that there was more to be said about this and especially more to be said at a sort of granular level that looks at like particular decisions to, you know, make a party lily white and then, you know, kind of traces out the mechanisms by which that uh, um, and the processes, sort of like a process tracing kind of perspective. And you have the, you know, data and, um, command of the historical material to tell that story. So maybe that's something you could do in the, in the future. Um, uh, so I, another thing that struck me along those lines was, um, and one of the things I appreciated about your narrative was the, that it highlighted that, you know, the solid South was in some ways less solid at the presidential level than it was below the presidential level. So you, you got these moments, I mean, I think people forget, like even though, yes, the Republican Party did very badly in the South through the one party period, um, it was still much more variable. Republican presidential performance was much more variable. And especially with, you know, Hoover coming along and winning five some Southern states or something like that. I mean, but making, but the key thing is making absolutely or almost no dent down ballot, you know? And um, so um, that, that, um, Anyway, that, that, that I think that's something that people um, don't necessarily know so much about, and so I appreciated that figuring to the narrative. Um, and in the interest of efficiency, I'll move on to my third point, <laughs> um, which is about um, the implications of the argument, um, which I think are really interesting and could can be further explored. So I'd be actually curious to hear what you think about the questions I'm about to ask. So one set of implications concerns if, um, the implications for the na the National Republican Party, okay. Um, so so the so first level, sort of more granular level, is like what elements of the Republican Party were systematically advantaged by the sort of rotten borough nature of Southern Republican parties. You know, so it's obvious that incumbents had an, you were able to use this because they controlled patronage already, so they were able to build support for renomination and so forth. Um, and the obviously the people with a lot of financial resources, <laughs> the candidates with financial resources were advantage. And those tended to be conservatives, although not always. But, it, um, but I was thinking particularly about 1912 as this uh, kind of uh, moment when, you know, t uh, yeah, it's, yeah, Taft um, fends off uh, a challenge from the left, um, from Roosevelt. Um, and it made me think more generally about whether this sort of rotten borough, existence of this rotten borough South precluded the emergence of a progressive Republican party in the early 20th century, right? Like, was it this sort of bulwark of conservatism actually that was controlled uh, by incumbents that, that prevented 
progressives from really taking over, which arguably was possible, um, or at least maintaining a, a serious presence in the Republican Party and leading them ultimately to realign into the Democratic Party later. Um, it's just a question and it's obviously a very speculative one, but I'd be curious to hear what you have to think about that for larger uh, partisan dynamics. Um, and then the second set of implications that are interesting to me is about um, thinking about the durability of the one party South, which is a question that I'm very particularly interested in. Um, and I, I was struck, I was, I was started thinking about Aldrich, maybe John will be talking about this, but Aldrich and Griffin's argument about uh, what a party system is, about party system being a competitive equilibrium between multiple parties, each of which is itself in equilibrium, right? And um, so Aldrich and Griffin, they say that the one party system, one party systems don't tend to be very stable. Uh, and my, my gloss on that, and one reason is that because if there's genuine political competition or opportunities for genuine political competition, there's always going to be incentives for ambitious politicians to try to create or take over a party and challenge the incumbents, right? Or, or, or uh, compete in elections, right? Um, but one of the interesting things about the, the sort of um, fact that these party, the Republican parties in the South had become so captured you know, or in this sort of patronage seeking rather than office seeking equilibrium is that they were essentially unavailable for that kind of mobilization, you know, or very difficult uh, to mobilize. Uh, and that um, obviously there are other dynamics to, going on there too. Um, uh, but it did seem to me to be uh, a, a sort of key prop of the one party system, the fact that you didn't. You couldn't easily convert the Republican Party, existing Republican parties, into office-seeking um, or electorally competitive uh, parties. Is one reason that political competition then migrated into the Democratic Party, uh, and there was that's a phenomenon I'm most interested in: um, intra-party competition in, in the Democratic Party. So, um, anyway, I'm just curious to hear what your thoughts are on those things, and also interested in hearing what John has to say. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start by pointing out that uh, I had the opportunity to go to Virginia um, from Jeff and got to meet Boris uh, pre presenting why parties matter um, to you and getting your feedback. Um, so I get to do that here. I get to get back at you here. <laughs> Appropriate expression uh, for this. Um, I'm going to focus primarily on <coughs> what I think needs to be done, whether that's yet, whether that's from you two together or separately, uh, or for other people, the other people listening in or whatever. Um, and let me start off um, with two things that have always fascinated me about essentially the period between the end of Reconstruction and uh, the coming of Jim Crow. Um, uh, first, I want to start off by saying that um, I don't think it's cited here, but I would have said it's the, my third, one of my top three books about Reconstruction, Ben Woodward's, Eric Cloner's, but John Hope Franklin's uh, Reconstruction After the Civil War. I, I happened to read it and Foner virtually at the same time. And it was like they had two completely distinct halves that together made a, 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 a bigger whole. And what, was, what, what, what John Hope was able to bring to the table that other people have been less um, uh, less focused on is uh, what did Reconstruction and, and what I'm thinking about now, post-Reconstruction, pre-Jim Crow mean for daily lives uh, for African-Americans in the South? Um, um, they were, um, you know, to the extent that we have a, a historiography, it focuses first on the the, the African-Americans who were in Congress or in other high elective office, uh, you've now added a, a new set for me and an entirely new set of people that I um, was uh, relatively unaware of in the, in the 
in the black and tans. The black and tans were sustained because they were able to maintain the support of the black electorate. And were they, you know, was that some insulation for the otherwise di diff already difficult and de deprived um, lives they were having to face with as freedmen? Um, as we might expect a political party uh, to take care of its, you know, of its uh, base of support uh, insofar as possible. So were their lives made better off because there was a black and tan. Um, the uh, second thing, this is not, I'm not really pumping Duke University authors, but I'm pumping Duke University authors as it turns out. Uh, Lawrence Goodwin's The Populist Moment um, um, pr ask a question that I think is the the question I I would like to have more on more than the the moment, but the sort of more in depth the sec second by second in your in, in your case. Um, you are much more historical than Lawrence Goodwin, the historian, was uh, in his history. Um, to be to be uh, to be quite honest, but his his idea was that. There was a chance for a second party. Um, the regulators in Virginia, that you, the, the fusion between Republicans and populists in North Carolina, especially, but also, what is it? At? They, they were fairly successful in Texas and Alabama. Um, that presented a moment when there could be a, an alternative party. It wouldn't be the Republican, it wouldn't call itself the Republican Party, probably wouldn't be aligned with the Republican Party explicitly. Um, but might be something very much like the CSU was for so long in the CDU. And in fact, it's slightly the same reasons. One of the great divisions in Germany um, was bridged by having a, a separate party in Bavaria um, um, that was able to work and, and align with um, uh, the CDU for so long. So, um, so that was the, the potential for uh, a viable class-based, it would be economic, and so it would be drawing uh, the poor whites and the African Americans into coalition uh, as, the, as the source of their support. Um, the Great Panic of 1893, you know, says, boy, th that's why that's the moment, right? Because um, that was, you know, at least the second greatest, or perhaps now moving in towards third greatest panic we've had. <laughs> uh, we'll see. Um, but certainly the, the second greatest um, uh, panic we've had, and it was as deep as the Great Depression. Um, um, just it, it was more V-shaped <laughs> in today's parlance, um, uh, for, fortunately for people living then. At any rate, um, so, so that's, that's a, I think, a topic that needs to be developed is why, well, I can understand why something called the Republican Party aligning itself with Lincoln, Grant, William Tecumseh Sherman, I can understand why that was a hard, harder sell perhaps <laughs> uh, to whites in the South, um, but, uh, but you could sell them a better life if you put together the bottom half of the, bottom 60% because they were the, bottom 60% living about as poor a life as the bottom 30% were, so uh, at least of whites. Um, so, uh, so why didn't that happen? Uh, and said it was, of course, lost and, 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 and apparently for, for, for good, um, partially because the Republicans didn't need them, didn't need the South, as you point out, um, leaving them the one, t one thing that, that they do need them or were able to use them for, which was presidential votes. The, I'd like to have, I think there's, I think there's more to it than nomination. I mean, there is nomination. There's, you, uh, you nailed that cleanly. You talk about patronage and I'm glad to see you going into the patronage um, because, uh, be, I mean, because the Republican Party needed the South for three day, days out of every four years if they were going to get their convention delegates. My guess is that if you had anything else to sell, you know, uh, 
it would it because it would have a something would have a durability. So I'm imagining something. I know this is an odd thing for a Rochester PhD to say, but something about good public policy about <laughs> Republican <laughs> presidents caring about the, the well good of the nation and being able to implement policy through essentially what I assume most of these are bureaucratic appointments in most offices and stuff like that. Um, and, um, and that had a lot of, you know, that had party building benefits, but it also had, you know, it also had ways of getting policies out through the party to the, to the, to the public. Um, not necessarily for winning elections, but maybe for just making people better off in life. It's crazy, crazy thought. <laughs> but there you go. Um, the next thing that I, the, it's it's my it's okay. So the big question about the South is sort of how close was it ever to a democracy after after Reconstruction? Um, and that's driven everything, and that's why you need to, you know, as as people point out, you, to talk about one party, you have to talk about both of them. <laughs> Uh, in, in some fashion, and, and this will be really apparent here because at least my assumption is that the missing element of what happens to the ambitious young politicians, you know, they would seem to be the people you would build if you were black and tan or really white, it doesn't really matter. This is what you would build the future on. The people who would want to have office would seek means of forming electoral coalitions that could could win city council seats, you know, township things, sheriff elections, if they had them then, I can't remember when sheriff elections came in, you know, the, 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 the local and state level offices, it, it needs this cadre of uh, usually young aspiring politicians. Um, and that's, and, and, you know, my sort of reading, I occasionally look at the pictures and, it, and it, they, they didn't, they struck me more as, as my age, um, rather than, um, Ashley's age, <laughs> the kind of people you would build on. So where, ha what happens to them today, you know, where, where they are, you know, as soon as Jim Crow comes in, does, does the does the white primary and so forth just to track them all into the Democratic Party? Could they not have formed um, uh, coalitions to try to win the uh, state and local offices? Um, let's see. There is one more thing that I won't thought that it was a, a question here that I think is a next round of, of research, which is the black and tan versus lily white uh, consequences. You do refer to it as a necessary condition. I mean, it, um, and, and you sometimes refer to it in well into the future, I guess, sort of separated in time, sort of a deep roots um, kind of, of argument. It's not fully developed. Um, and there's a lot of work that would need to be done to get the mechanism right, uh, to consider um, especially, if, especially if delay is, is, is okay, um, to, um, uh, to, to deal with, um, uh, the sort of counter necessary conditions, the, the, you know, other, other can candidates for only if, uh, conditions, um, and that would seem to be that the, um, suppression of black political participation in, in all ways at the, with the in, in you know in, enactment of Jim Crow would um, just you know if if if, you, if they can't if they're not going to be able if, you know if the sheriff and the uh, uh, are is going to are going to be there you know helping to you know, suppress black votes. Um, you just can't build, you just can't count on them. And so you need, you need to have a coalition that's going to be centered on whites to get started, even if you're going to hope to be able to attract blacks when you can figure out a way to, 
have enough control over the local environment to make it possible for them to, to vote more. So, uh, so, so that seems to be the obvious. It, the implementation of Jim Crow is, is the answer to the question of why eventually Lily Whites win and why, um, uh, and why further on down the, the road they become, uh, they get a chance for Republicans to win. One couple of comments on, uh, on Devin, if I could uh, extend his, his, re, his very, very interesting remarks. One of them was this about the, the activists and candidates and people who be party, the, the real grunt work of building the party at the local and state level. You have other places where there are one-sided, very one-sided party majorities at the same time, like New England, you know, Rhode Island, Maine, Vermont, you know, Democrats couldn't compete. Did, did the Democratic Party become a similarly attenuated party that focused on only a small set of the goals we normally imagine a, a party, a ma major party in a two-party system having? Um, um, or did they at least have shadow versions of a, of a, a full menu of party, uh, you know, party activities, uh, even if they're, even if they're a low probability of having, getting any fruit out of them. This would go a long way, I think, towards answering the, 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 the final questions about um, sort of how democratic how undemocratic was the certainly the, the Jim Crow and on uh, Democratic Party in the South and hence the South as a region? How, how undemocratic was it? Um, was it significantly different from um, lopsided majority districts elsewhere? My suspicion is it is. It was. You know, this violence stuff is the main thing. And it was the, uh, the um, agreement of the national government not to intervene um, and, and, and the sustained potential and actuality of use of violence as a part of the democratic, probably in this case, capital D system uh, of, of politics in the South um, until sometime after after the war for as part of that it seems to me that what you describe as the republican party um what, what you see is the democratic party um both of them seem to have this the elite that are suppressing the republican inclinations of an electorate who be willing to vote for hoover did a good job and sort of so as, as far as i can tell and in the great Mississippi flood and that made them sort of sustainable in the South, but he, you know, it wasn't that he was um, particularly southernly oriented. Eisenhower, there were people that regular voters were more than willing to vote for. If you had a two party system, you could well imagine relatively easily Republicans having winning a, a lot of different elections. Uh, may, may not be a majority uh, party until much later, but they, but they could have been a competitive party um, at winning 20% of the seats or 30% or something like that. But thank you for pushing us a whole lot farther along on this, on this project of, of the South and the nation. Um, so Boris, I, I, I opened. Um, did you want to open the you know, thoughts, responses at all? All right. Um, thanks so much. This was really, this was really good and, and, and helpful. Um, there's a couple of themes that have kind of popped out and I was taking note very quickly, but my handwriting is atrocious, so I can't read them. Um, but there's a couple of things that I think multiple people brought up. So one is sort of like the, the issue of sort of the, what do the people on the ground actually get out of, you know, being the party? And is there actually a policy uh, uh, angle to it? Um, one component is what do 
know, black Republicans get out of still being part of this party. Um, I think one of the points Kim made was uh, that we sort of mentioned somewhat briefly in the book, but the, the fact that there is, you know, this becomes the last remaining sort of access point to any type of political participation at some point. Like right after Reconstruction, there's this uh, period, very short period, where um, black Republicans uh, get elected, in some cases to you know state legislatures, some cases even Congress. Um, they actually affect you know policy at the state level and at the national level, um, and that of course very quickly ends with the end of Reconstruction. And at that point, there really isn't much left. Like there aren't. There's some cases that are clear exceptions. North Carolina, there's still you know for a couple of decades, black black politicians still win elections. Uh, George White is a member of Congress uh, up until 1900, um, but those are pretty rare. And so what's left at that point is just being being a delegate to the Republican National Convention. I mean, that's that's the one remaining sort of access point to any type of political power. And I, I think, you know, there, there are cases in the in the transcripts, uh, particularly earlier on, sort of like still in the 19th century, when there's any type of debate about um, should we change the number of sort of delegates, given the fact that, you know, we're not going to win in the South. We're not going to win elections there. We're not going to win electoral votes. Why? Why do we have you know this many Southern delegates? Where there's really passionate debate on the floor, and you know black politicians saying, "This is all we have left." You know, and the reason there's not we're not winning in the South is not because we're not working hard or not you know we don't put up a fight. It's because it's an unfair fight. We've, everything's been taken from us except this. Um, and I think that's a crucial component to it. As time goes on, uh, the financial element does, you know, start playing a part. And, and uh, you know, as Jeff mentioned, we're working on a next project where we try to be a little bit more uh, consistent in trying to sort of identify exactly how much uh, money we're talking about. But we have a couple of examples in the book where, you know, a nice postmastership you could probably sell for about two thousand dollars at the time, which adds up to about thirty thousand dollars today. Um, and so, if you sell a couple of those, that that add, does add up. So you see people like Gary Howard, who's a black man who ran the Mississippi Republican Party up until uh, 1960, um, was prosecuted twice for it, uh, for trying to sell offices uh, and, and got, got off both times. But, uh, you know, there's a situation there, too, where, like, why is he doing all this? There presumably weren't a lot of options available in Mississippi in the 1920s to sort of figure yourself as a black man who was highly educated. Uh, presumably had big ambitions, uh, what is there to do except, you know, try to join this party uh, and then use it for what everybody's been using it for. Um, one other point uh, that uh, Devin made was the sort of, uh, you know, the, the, the who owns, who sort of takes control of the South at different moments in time and the implications that might have had for um, the historical development of the Republican Party. And whether it could have, you know, there's a counterfactual world where it could have become a more left-wing progressive party. Um, that's an interesting point. So we look at the 1912 uh, convention in in some detail. Um, one of the things that that there seems to be a really big debate on among historians and a couple of political scientists who really uh, focused on it is to what extent the um, you know the South selection of delegates was really unfair towards Roosevelt. So Taft dominated in the South and that helped him uh, you know, get a majority at the convention. And then Roosevelt walks out before they ever have a vote, but it's pretty clear he would have lost. Um, and you know, the Roosevelt crowd at the time uh, and also after uh, has long argued that sort of the reason why 1912 was lost at the Republican convention is because of the South and how unfair it was and all that. And so there's a couple of components there. One is Roosevelt himself as president used the South exactly the same way as Taft did. Um, and he actually sort of handed over the Republican Party organizations to Taft once he sort of handpicked Taft as his successor. Um, so it's a little hypocritical to then go from like, I'm outraged that this kind of stuff is happening. Um, you could imagine that given how close the South was, if that had, uh, how close the 12, 12 convention was that had that been slightly different, that it could have flipped the outcome and that if Roosevelt had won the nomination in 1912, maybe it would have been different outcome. Um, but in terms of like, is there sort of an ideological component to who the South supported? I don't know. Uh, we, we dealt with that a little bit with the um, sort of kind of support that was happening in the 1940s more so. Um, I think earlier on, it feels like it's more that 
the delegates supported whoever they whoever already was in charge of incumbent presidents or whoever was up and coming and they believed had the best shot um, at winning. And then I'll do one more and then I'll hand it off to, to Jeff. Um, so the question of the that Ashley raised of sort of uh, at what point are people talking elites to elites versus at what point is it in leads to the actual population um, uh, conversation? That's a really great question. And I don't know, like there's no systematic way, I guess, to really get at that. Although there's interesting ways perhaps in terms of like how are local newspapers writing about it and maybe, you know, any uh, enterprising writers into, who finds this interesting can like do a content analysis of local newspapers in terms of like, are people at, you know, they are talking about it, like we use them as sources in, in the book, but to what end is there like systematic coverage of these kind of things um, in white newspapers and black owned newspapers and things like that. So that could be an interesting thing. It seems like people do care at least a little bit. Um, and certainly it seems like there was a component to it that transcended um, just the sort of bubble uh, elite versus elites uh, competition um, when it came to uh, the very few remaining black uh, leaders in the party later on. So by 1932, Hoover uh, tries to kick out the last uh, remaining black and tans at the 32 convention. And he succeeds in South, with um, South Carolina, which is a black and tans organization, but it's led by a white man, uh, Titus Joe Colbert, because he doesn't like ties. Um, and then, uh, uh, but he fails with the other two organizations, which are both led by black men. And the, the, the reason seems to be that there was a lot of outcry from uh, black Republicans and, you know, black activists in general outside of the South against, you know, getting rid of the very few remaining uh, black Southern politicians. And that seems to have been a situation where with the presidential election coming up and all that, there was some genuine concern about uh, the image, at least, of kicking out uh, black leaders and how that was going to affect uh, the party electorally. Um, I'll, I'll hand it over to Jeff. Okay, thanks, Boris. Um, so I have I have some scattered thoughts about some of the the different points. Um, Boris has um, touched on some of them already. Um, one of the first things I thought about, uh, both in terms of um, one of uh, Kim's points about the Democrats uh, delegitimizing the Republicans um, by blackening the party, right, through some of their, their rhetoric. And, and Ashley's point about, you know, the historic uh, drawing of the color line and the, 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 the point at which uh, we're talking about elites communicating with each other or the public. Uh, the first thing I actually thought about was something that, um, that, that isn't in the book that we didn't write about, right? So, um, you know, thinking about um, um, the 1840s in the South, when there was an actual two-party system in place, right? The Whigs and the Democrats were vying for control. And throughout that decade, uh, there was almost, a, you know, there was almost always a, um, into, into the early 1850s, there was almost kind of a race to become uh, the more racially conservative party. So in, in uh, election campaigns, right, the one thing that neither party wanted to do was to allow the other party to uh, appear to be the more racially conservative party. Um, so that was clearly a case where um, each party was de facto trying to blacken the other party a bit, right, making it seem to be weaker or, or lighter on race than they were. And it was also the case where um, this was a good example of elites talking to the public, right? trying to essentially communicate to the public that, that they were the true racially conservative party at a time when um, the South was beginning to um, face some challenges from national, the, the sort of face some, face some opposition to their continued quest to move West. And, and gobble up more territory. So um, that's kind of, you know, so I'm, I'm channeling William Frayling, right? And some of the stuff that I've read in the past, right? I'm not channeling my book in that particular case, but it, um, it did make me think about those things. Uh, some of Devin's questions, you know, kind of the granular questions that we probably have anecdotal answers to. We don't have anything systematic, right? How are delegates chosen? 
uh, how did the Republican delegates in the South, but probably both black and white feel about their party, right? That sort of thing. Uh, we know that, you know, based upon anecdotal reading, that during at least a good chunk of this, this book's period, uh, there were multiple levels of conventions in the South. Um, I don't know to what extent, you know, when primaries took hold in, in the various states in the Republican Party and the degree to which the Republican Party uh, in the South, um, um, you know, kind of hewed to primaries. Um, that's probably easily kind of um, discovered. Um, so I, I, I talked a little bit about this, you know, that 1600 page document um, that's, that's awaiting us. It's waiting for us, right? That's waiting us um, to look at. Uh, I've, I've skimmed through it, but um, these are congressional hearings, right? And takes place in five parts. And each of the five parts has about 10 to 12 people that are brought in from the South, right? You know, sort of leaders in the South, but then kind of underlings as well. And that's, you know, that's, that's not systematic, but it does give you plenty of anecdotes to kind of get a sense of what some of the people who are close to power, so to speak, in the South, and then farther from power actually were thinking about in terms of um, their party. You know, just one of the things that kind of pops into my mind that I found kind of amusing was um, at one point in this, um, at one point in the hearings, uh, and they were run by the Republican Party, right? So this is 1928 to 1930. So the Republicans has, have unified control of government. And they're doing these hearings at a time when, you know, essentially there's a lot of um, public attention to what's going on in the South because a, a, a Georgia delegate commit, you know, commits suicide, kills someone and commits suicide, right? There's this murder-suicide of a postmaster in Georgia. And he leaves behind a note kind of saying, you know, he just, he couldn't, gobble, you know, he couldn't cobble together the money to be able to hold on to this thing. Um, the newspapers run with it. The Republicans feel like they need to have some sort of kind of, you know, public hearing on it. Um, and what they do is they, they turn over the, you know, the, the, uh, the questioning to Democratic senators, right, from the states, at least initially, right? So the Democratic, Democratic senators are actually asking questions to these Republicans who are, you know, Republican postmasters, they're holding some positions in the state. And it's kind of funny, all this, you know, going back and forth. And they're kind of, you know, there's like, there's an 800 pound gorilla in the room, nobody wants to kind of talk about it, right? You know, so, you know, I remember one set of questions. So you guys really don't run candidates in elections, right? Um, no, no, we, no, we really don't. But yet you have a, a you you have a, a national office for twelve months a year that you that you you know you pay rent on right you have multiple people working in that office why are you holding you know why do you actually pay the rent on that building if you're not doing anything well we have people coming to to visit us oh really you mean like postmasters yeah postmasters will stop in occasionally to visit us and it's important to you know be able to talk to people back in Washington about what what's going on. Oh, okay. So these postmasters, they're, 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 they're providing money to get their positions. Oh, no, no, no. We never, we never, you know, we never make that a, a litmus test. So what they do is they provide voluntary contributions, right? Once they get the positions, right? Because they want to, you know, they want to, you know, you know, they want to support the, 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 the party. Oh, really? Okay. So it's, it's back and forth and back and forth. Um, and, um, you know, there is lots of, lots of interesting data that they actually try to, you know, to collect about how much is being given by which postmaster. Um, so it's, it's gotten us interest in going back there. And I think it does, it, it would be a kind of an interesting story, at least from the lens of reading those 1600 pages, along with newspapers during the time, right, to kind of get another perspective. Um, let's see. I think, you know, Devin's question about, you know, to what extent were, you know, did the, did the, 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 the transition in Southern delegations into rotten boroughs make them more likely to support conservatives, right? Make it less likely that um, any kind of meaningful progressive movement within the Republican Party would find support from the South. I think it's a really interesting question. And, and my, 
my first gut instinct is to say that's probably that sounds to me probably right that the south was probably an obstacle to any kind of true true progressive movement within the republican party the south was not going to be um probably you know it, it was not going to be a sympathetic um client group to anything like that um that they would be probably much more um, in keeping with conservative tendencies and conservative movements. And that, that sort of, it gets me to one of John's points about ambitious young politicians and the composition of parties during the time. When I first gave what was um, an, early, an early kind of look into this book, long before it was quite finished, I gave a talk here at, at USC a couple of years ago. And, um, you know, as I was on my first couple of slides, uh, my colleague, John Matsusaka, who's in uh, the business school here, right, who's an economist at heart. And because he's an economist, he's certainly not going to wait to ask his questions, right? So he jumps in pretty quickly. And one of the things that he, he just kind of, he just couldn't, couldn't believe at the time or was, was, was um, um, just resistant to the notion that, um, anybody who had any kind of real desire to be influential was going to be a Republican during this period. Why would you do that? Why would you just, you know, and this was, a, this was specifically about the Lily Whites. Why would you, why would you try to start this kind of this rival group to the Republican party when you could have, you know, when you knew that there was never going to be any chance that you'd be successful electorally? Um, you know, why would you throw in with this group instead of just becoming a good Democrat? Um, and I tried to make the case at that time, and, and again, it was based on the information that we had, and it was anecdotal. Well, there was all this patronage involved, right? This Republican patronage that could essentially be morselized, right? You know, you could sell off this stuff, right? And actually selling off a lot of these things, uh, it could bring in a lot of money. And he was like, ah, I, don't, I, just, don't, I just don't know. Um, so that, that makes me much more interested in, in trying to show systematically, right, how much money was involved. Um, but one of the things I was trying to argue at the time was, and, and, you know, was kind of, you know, I had thrown up some, some photos of some of the early Lily Whites. Um, and these were businessmen. These were local businessmen, generally speaking, who were pretty successful. Um, and, you know, by and large, they would be much more amenable to uh, a national Republican party than a, uh, a national Democratic party at that time, right? They, their, their financial and economic interests would have made them Republicans. Um, and um, it seems like that would be um, a pretty good argument for them looking forward in time, right? Being, um, you know, prospective about um, making the Republican Party, such as it was at the time, a real party, thinking ahead of trying to figure out some way to make it a real party. Um, and, you know, like a lot of businessmen, they cut to the chase a lot of times, right? They get to the bottom line. And for them, their belief was that, you know, uh, a Republican Party that was governed to any meaningful extent by African Americans was not a party that's ever going to do well in the white electorate there. Right? It's just, it, there, there are too many bad memories from uh, the past. And for them at the time, the past was not that much of a past, right? Their, their grandparents were still alive and maybe some of their parents were still alive and they recognized what the Republican party meant to them. So this is something else I wanted to kind of think about diving into, right? So this could be a, another part of the project is really, really thinking about, and we, we, we actually talked about this, right? At one point we were gonna write a convention paper, a conference paper. When there, you know, when there were conferences, right, the real conferences, um, you know, and just do kind of an accounting of who these guys actually were, right? You know, look at the census forms because we have we have all the individual census forms, right? And we've made them publicly available, right? Um, not quite. Um, um, Boris can tell tell you a little bit about that. He he uploaded a, a bunch of information to bunch of information to Dataverse a week or two ago. Um, but we could actually do a pretty good accounting of who these guys actually were, not just the Lily Whites as they began to form, but actually who were the African-American delegates in um, the latter part of the 19th century? You know, what, what were their occupations? Um, how much did they actually move across time, right? How much did they, you know, I mean, there's a lot of interesting, 
um, information that's probably that probably can be probably can be plumbed without too much too much extra effort. You know, the the, the data in various forms is there, um, and you know, I'd like to do it at some point when we have it. Boris, did you want to talk? Yeah, so in terms of what, what data we shared, uh, we shared a, uh, the full list of all the delegates, and, uh, which is about 8,660 of them, um, and their um, participation in different, con in different conventions and uh, their racial coding, including where they lived at different times in a lot. Um, so we have that uh, available. Uh, I don't think we are allowed to share the actual PDFs of the Ancestry uh, stuff, because Ancestry has copyright on that, so they would probably sue us. Um, so we don't have that available online, but everybody can uh, download the actual. Uh, we also get to a question that was on the uh, Q and A uh, from uh, Joel. Sure, Peter. sure. Um, and Joel asked uh, basically how the uh, Great mig Migration affects things. So the fact that you know in the 1910s, 1920s, 1930s, a large amount of uh, large number of Black people moved from the South to the North, and whether there were any of the uh, people who were politically active before. Um, you know, remain politically active uh, once they move to the north. Uh, and the short answer to that is we have no idea. This is not something we looked at, but it's a very, it's a really interesting question uh, whether or not any of those uh, those black Republicans who were actually convention delegates at some point uh, moved out of the south. Um, but you know, the, the list is available, so either we could do it or uh, anybody with an internet connection could try to get at that question. Yeah. No. Um, yeah. Go. So I can, I'll just say that um, uh, Harold Gosnell has this great book on Chicago politics. Um, and there are a number of people who've left the South, Tennessee, et cetera, who go to Chicago and then very much get involved in Chicago politics, the black Republicans. So I think there's evidence there, but it's sort of tricky because it, it sort of ships and in, warps into sort of urban politics literature and less about the sort of national politics literature. Uh, I've, I've certainly read some papers lately by economic historians who have been doing interesting work on census tracing and tracing of individuals across time. Uh, one of my colleagues here at, in, in the, the business school um, recently wrote a, a paper on um, um, passing across time, the, the degree to which um, African Americans could pass as white and try to determine how big uh, how, you know, how much actually did tracing go on, right? Um, there, I'm sorry, did passing go on? How big of a, uh, a phenomenon was it? And what they did was they just traced individuals across time. They used, you know, the individual census forms and examined uh, the data in them and whether they were, you know, uh, telling the, the census taker they were black or white. Um, uh, but that's, you know, that's one way that you could do, you know, that sort of tracing. Another is to, you know, essentially use the names that we have that we've cobbled together and see to what, to what degree first there was a good deal of out migration across time, right? That these individuals were actually leaving southern states and where were they going, right? And, you know, you could trace them to particular northern states and then you can examine whether they were actually involved in, in politics at the time. Um, that's another great, great question. John, did you have one there? Just two quick Point. One of them is that um, you would anticipate that most of the might you know, disproportionately skewed towards young adults uh, in the Great Migration, um, just like most every other difficult migration, um, and and so that actually you know so that un undermines the the source of the the people who would who would you would you would recruit to build. Um, the second thing we're talking about the Republican conservative businessmen, sort of Main Street uh, kind of businessmen. Uh, remember that the Southern Democratic congressional delegation was, at least according to Poole Rosenthal standards, in the 20s and thir early 30s, the, and, and somewhat earlier, the most liberal voting record of any party group, um, party regional group. So that, that so that, that would leave the, conser the, the conservative end, which may be also related to the, the long-term success of the party. If you're, if, if you're Lily Whites or conservative businessmen, you know, that may re reverberate into the future. 
I just had one more thought related to the Great Migration, which, of, yep. which is more like a, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can, yep. Okay, um, which is, uh, it's just the macro um, uh, 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 development of the fact that in, at the beginning, uh, you know, there were almost no black, I mean, at the beginning, I mean, by in the 19th century, there were almost no black voters in the North, right? And then, um, and so the kind of the kinds of dynamics that you're talking about Hoover losing votes in 1932 and among black voters in the North for supporting um, a really white faction, you know, is that's not going to be, that's not going to matter very much um, uh, post uh, post disenfranchisement in the South. So like uh, there's this kind of uh, irregular pattern where, you know, you have a lot first in the 19th century, you have lots of black voters in the South. And then they're almost exclusively disenfranchised. So then there are almost no black voters in the whole country. But then as they gradually move north, then black, you know, this is part of the long term uh, um, structural conditions that help um, drive, um, you know, attention to civil rights among Northern Democrats and so forth. But um, it's just another thought, I, another angle on the same phenomenon. Yeah, so in this, in this other book that I just finished, right, that looks at um, civil rights in Congress across time, there's this big gap, right, between, you know, after the, the Lodge Bill fails in 1891, um, the Republicans essentially give up for a while in terms of moving civil rights. And for a couple of decades, you know, around three decades, there's really no meaningful civil rights legislation on the national agenda until you get to right after World War I. Right. And because of the great migration, the first great migration that occurs, you, you now have um, some meaningful um, African-American representation in some northern cities. And that group of African-Americans happens to be pivotal in terms of thinking about, you know, what otherwise might be the winner or the loser among Republicans or Democrats. And civil rights in the 20th century really begins because of a consequence of um, the first, first great migration and the Red Scare. Um, so in the 19, 1920s and 1930s, the, you know, the civil rights you know, legislation that's on the national agenda is anti-lynching legislation, right? So that's first brought up in the, the you know, 1918 by Leonidas Steyer, who's from a Republican from St. Louis from Missouri. It's voted on in the early 1920s. The Republicans are still essentially the, the party of civil rights at that time. And then it, it pops up again in the late 1930s. And the Democrats by that time had taken over and become essentially the, the prime movers on anti-lynching. So um, this is just a, a way to say, yes, I think the, the, the notion of the, the first great migration being a meaningful moment in beginning to change, um, you know, the civil rights trajectory in the, in, in the United States is, is, is probably probably right. Uh, Kim, did you want to, did you have a point or question? I think it was more a, a different kind of migration. Um, okay. Which you, you alluded to a little bit, which is that sort of post-World War II migration of more educated whites to the South, right? This sort of creation of the Sun Belt. Um, and so I'm wondering, you know, this, how did these sort of new middle class whites kind of influence the shaping of the Republican Party in these metropolitan areas? And I think you, you kind of allude to it a little bit, but I'm just wondering, is there, is part of the sort of the growth of the Republican Party, not only what's happening at the national level, but sort of replacement of voters, if you will? Um, because of this white migration to the South. Yeah, I mean, I saw that in some of the, the case studies we did, right? The, the one on Tennessee talks about the, the quote unquote new Republicans, right? That, that pops up in the 50s and 60s. Um, you know, they're not attached to the old, you know, they're not part of the old Lily Whites. Um, and I think that's a, that's a good example of the types of people that you're talking about, right? The, the, the Northern exports and their children, I suppose, right? Um, trying to think, you know, I want to say that some recent historians have looked at that a little bit. Um, I'm trying to, I'm blanking on their names right now. Um, I don't know if one of Kevin Cruz's first books was on this, maybe not. Um, 
Yeah, sorry, I can't, I, I, I can't help beyond that. Looks like we got another question in here. Oh, Pam McCann, my, my colleague here. She's probably going to ask a really hard one. Uh, John Aldrich mentioned an interesting difference in the ages of folks in the pictures as opposed to the intuition, in, as opposed to his intuition in who would be recruited. Did you notice pattern in the census forms re-age as well as race over time? Uh, I don't know that I, I noticed the pattern anecdotally, but we would have that information, right? We could, we could easily yeah. kind of put that information together. Um, we could easily you know. look it up. Um, I, one of the things that just anecdotally seemed interesting was, not, perhaps not surprising, there's a number of, of delegates who go to many conventions. Um, and so you've got people who go, you know, five, six conventions even sometimes. Uh, and so they start out relatively young and then they age. Um, there's also cases where, this is actually an issue we ran into in terms of the coding, which is that, you know, you have the, we had the names and we had uh, the city they lived in or the town they lived in, the state they lived in, and we know they were alive at the time of the National Convention and that was it. Which is not the best sort of, um, like the most optimal sort of information you need to match someone uh, under census form, like would help to get a date of birth or something like that, which we didn't have. So there were cases where we would try to sort of like do the matching and you would really have to sort of like dig a little deeper to see whether, you know, the, the name that popped up in Ancestry actually could plausibly be a convention delegate. So like if, you know, there's a convention in, you know, 1896, you look at the 1900 census and there's a person with the name who lives in the town, but they're four years old, then obviously that is not, you know. <laughs> um, and so we ran into issues with like that. And you do get into situations where it's like, you know, there's a 24 year old, do we believe that that person is the person? And then we try to be pretty conservative in terms of like who we matched. We didn't want to, you know, incorrectly match people. Uh, and so sometimes we would, we would just kick those people out. Um, but there would also be cases where you would have, you know, a 24 year old or 25 year old who was a post, you know, working for a post office, had a very unique name and was a convention delegate that year. And it seems like, well, it seems like that, that is that person. Um, so I, there, we don't have anything just systematic yet on age, but it's an interesting thing that we could look at and it would be pretty easy to, to collect that. All right, I think, uh, I think that's it from the, the peanut gallery. I don't see any more questions here. Um, well, thanks again uh, for everybody taking the, taking the time to, to read the book and, and, and giving us feedback. Uh, Ashley, John, Devin, and Kim. Uh, thanks to, to Harley for hosting it uh, via, via Zoom here. Thanks to Jack for his, his opening comments. Thanks to the uh, participants out there lurking, some, some of whom asked a few questions. Um, I hope we'll be able to see each of you in person at some point in the future. Who knows when that will be? Um, but um, thanks, thanks much, and please have a good rest of the day. Forrest, Thank did you, you want to add anything Bye. there? No, same deal. Thank you so much for, for uh, joining us and, and giving your feedback. It was really helpful and uh, uh, really insightful, and uh, this was fun. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you.